Hello. Good morning. Welcome to this online service. Do pray for Clive Green and Sophie Clent. They're getting married at Wollaston on Saturday and we pray for God's blessing on them. Lord, um, uh, we pray as we worship this morning that uh, we would know your love and your peace and your comfort. And Lord, as Clive and Sophie start married life, Lord, I do pray for your blessing on them. Lord, would they um, know your grace and your favour on their married life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
the tallest thing you have ever made? Was it just me in secondary school and primary school where I get everything in my pencil case and see what's the tallest tower I can build on my desk? Well, today we've got a challenge for you. You have one minute, I'll do it too. You've got one minute with everything around you. What's the tallest tower you can build? hours earlier that the base affected the rest of the tower. In the minute we had, if our foundation wasn't strong, the tower would just fall over. If we had strong foundations, there's a much greater chance that the tower would be able to stand. And this is exactly the same in our own lives. We could think everyone is building their life on something. Whether it's strong or whether it's flimsy, we're all building our life upon something. And it is quite hard to think, actually, what am I building my life on? And I find it a lot easier to think of it in kind of this way, is, what occupies my thoughts? What drives my actions? What is it that I'm always focusing on? I think for a lot of us, especially at this age, it can be things like popularity, social media following, fame, just things you're like, I wanna feel something, I wanna be included, this is what I'm gonna drive towards. But a lot of these things are temporary, a lot of these things don't last. We can find these things hurt us, they trap us because they're not all what they're meant to be. And for me, I was in exactly that same place. I got to about to the age of 17 thinking, what am I actually doing? When tough times hit, when hard times came, what am I doing in my life? What am I building? What am I focusing on? And for me, the best thing was a relationship with Jesus. It was something that didn't change, no matter what the circumstances were, no matter how hard life got, I had a rock and a strength that held me up throughout. 
See, Jesus, it wasn't just a distant figure. He was a personal relationship I had where I could be like, I am not strong, but I know you are. I know you can give me a hope and a purpose that stands when things get hard. And Jesus himself says, for I have come to give life and life to all its fullest. And that doesn't mean that life to its fullest means loads of money, loads of cars, is everything we possibly could want. It means that when life gets hard, we can still thrive. And we can thrive because we have a foundation, a strength that cannot be taken away. So my challenge for you today is to, it's almost a preparation, a preparation from life gets hard. Look around you, look, actually, what am I building my life on? What are my foundations? What do I rely on? And then think, are these things temporary? Or are these things gonna stand when life gets hard? Today's reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realised Jesus had gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give for you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's work too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. If you've ever asked yourself the question, what does God want from me? Then this might help. In last week's service, Nigel Clent discussed the miracles of Jesus walking on the water and the feeding of the 5,000. He asked an important question. He said, why was the feeding of the 5,000 such an important part of Jesus' ministry that it was the only miracle that was reported in all four of the Gospels? Nigel concluded that this would be a test to the disciples to encourage them to keep their focus on Jesus and to trust him for the solution to all of life's problems including feeding over 10,000 men, women and children with a boy's packed lunch. And this requirement to keep your eyes on Jesus is highlighted in Matthew's version of Jesus walking on the water. Matthew included a story about Peter walking on the water after Jesus had said to him, come. And he says this, then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? The answer to Jesus' question actually seems a bit obvious now. Because whilst Peter was looking at Jesus, he had the faith to get down out of the boat and to walk on the water. And he was the only one of the disciples who tried it. 
But once he took his eyes off Jesus and on the problems, on the wind and the waves, he became fearful and he began to sink. I find that description fascinating. He began to sink. If you have ever stepped off the side of a swimming pool onto water, you will know that as soon as your feet touch that water, you do not begin to sink. You drop like a stone. You go down so fast, you certainly wouldn't have time to cry out, Lord, save me, and again, have time for somebody to grab you. In Peter's case, however, the implication is that he slowly started to sink with enough time to cry out and for Jesus to catch him. St John's Gospel describes Jesus walking on the water as happening later that night. That is the same day as the feeding of the 5,000. And today's reading starts with the crowd who had been fed are looking for Jesus. This is the next day they're looking for Jesus. They know that the disciples have taken the only boat and they know that Jesus didn't go with them. But they can't find Jesus anywhere. And so they decide to get into some boats that have just come over from Tiberias. And they decide to go over the, the sea to Capernaum to look for him. And sure enough, they found Jesus on the other side of the lake. And they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Because clearly they didn't know anything about Jesus walking on the water in the night in order to join his disciples on the boat. So instead of answering their question, Jesus points out that they were only seeking him because he had fed them and not because they'd understood the significance of the miracles that he performed, namely that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus goes on to tell them that they shouldn't be spending all their energy on perishable things like food, but they should be seeking the eternal life that only he could give because, and I quote, God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Now the Father's seal of approval on Jesus was shown in numerous ways throughout the New Testament, starting with the voice from heaven when Jesus was baptised. And the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And after his baptism, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And thereafter, he only did and said the things that his Father showed him or that they asked him to do, or gave him to speak. And throughout his ministry, Jesus kept his eyes on the Father, and the signs and wonders followed him wherever he went. But in addition to the signs and wonders, the Father directly expressed his approval of Jesus again on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appeared to talk with Jesus about his forthcoming crucifixion. Peter, James and John are there and they witness the, everything that happened and an overawed Peter wanted to do something and he offered to build three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses and one for Elijah, which suggests that all three should be honoured in the same way. And this prompted the Father to again speak from heaven, leaving the three terrified disciples in no doubt that Jesus was in a different class to the giants of the Old Testament. The father said, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. After Jesus had told the crowd in Capernaum that they should be seeking the eternal life that only he could give, they asked what they should be doing to carry out the works of God. Or as one translation puts it, what does God want us to do? And in verse 29, Jesus tells them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. These words from Jesus are as true today as they were then. But human beings always want to earn their way to heaven. This is what most religions are about. We like to feel that there's something that we can do to merit salvation. We want to somehow contribute to the saving of our own souls so that we can feel good about ourselves. 
but as always Jesus knows our hearts. And these people whom Jesus had fed the day before said that they wanted to work for God, but Jesus knew that they didn't want to have anything to do with him, God's son. Undoubtedly, God wants us to do good works, but we cannot earn our way to heaven no matter how many good works we do. Before we can do good works for God, we must first believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. The only good work that any sinner can do is to confess his sins and receive Christ as his Lord and his Saviour. The true nature of the crowd in Capernaum was shown in their next demand, which was to see Jesus perform a miraculous sign before they would believe in him. These are the same people who just witnessed firsthand the multiplication of the bread and fish, and here they were the next day, asking him to prove his claims to be the Son of God. The world always wants to see before it believes, but God says that if we believe, then we will see. Faith must always come first, and without faith it is impossible to please God. The crowd reminded Jesus of the miracle of the manna in the wilderness in such a way as to imply that Jesus was not as great as Moses because Jesus had only multiplied food, food that already existed, whereas Moses had called down food from heaven. Jesus' answer is that it wasn't Moses that gave them the manna, but God and that the manna was literal food that kept the Israelites alive from day to day, whereas he was the true bread that came down from heaven, giving life to all men, to the whole earth. The crowd couldn't grasp what Jesus was saying, and they asked him to give them the bread from heaven every day so that they wouldn't have to be hungry again. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger again, Whoever ever believes in me will never be thirsty. And John records later in this chapter that the crowd began to grumble about Jesus because he had said that he was the true bread that had come down from heaven. And because of their grumbling, Jesus not only reiterated what he had already said about being the bread of life, but he went on to say that his flesh was true food and that his blood was true drink. And towards the end of this chapter it says, Many of his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And I have to say that I have some sympathy with the disciples and with the crowd at this point. You have to remember that they didn't know that Jesus was going to lay down his life for the sins of the world and that he would teach his disciples to share bread and wine in remembrance of his broken body and his shed blood. They could understand that Jesus had been sent by his Father to suffer and die in the place of fallen humanity in order to bring about a new covenant that the Old Testament prophets had just written about. The contemporary version of the Bible translates John 3.16 as this, God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. This is the crux of the gospel. This is the gospel in a nutshell. The good news of the gospel is that the cross of Jesus qualifies all of us for eternal life. At the cross, all our sins are forgiven, and we are given a right standing with God the Father. As Paul would say, we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes it. But it's only for those who believe. Those who don't believe in the gospel do not qualify for the new covenant. Jesus himself answered the question, what does God want for, us, want for us to do? And that answer is to put our faith in him. The new covenant is based entirely on God's unmerited favour. 
There's nothing for us to do and there's nothing for us to perform, nothing for us to accomplish. Our part in the new life in Christ is just to have faith in Jesus, to believe that we are totally forgiven and free to enjoy all the blessings that come to us freely because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. This is the Gospel of Christ. Amen. Should we pray this morning? Lord, we thank you uh, for who you are. And thank you that um, what you most require of us, as the scripture says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And Lord, we cannot imagine, we can't really understand in this life how much the Father delights in those who choose to believe in the Son, who choose to follow him, who choose to surrender their lives to him, who choose to accept the cross. And Lord, we thank you uh, when we do get glimpses of your delight in us um, following you, of believing in you, of putting our, ourselves um, as your followers. And Lord, as we seek to do that, I do pray that you would lead and guide us. Lead and guide us to expand our faith, to expand our understanding. Let us put ourselves in the right place to grow in that, in that understanding. Let us serve you well in the daily life. Lord, we know um, uh, in your word says, well, what do, do you require of us to do to do kindness and justice and mercy and Lord I pray that we would um, live that out in the day to day in the every day in the relationships we have um, around us and Lord uh, we we pray over our planet at this time we see uh, so much um, disaster we see wars and um, floods and uh, and misery around us in various places lord we pray lord for your kingdom to come on earth for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven lord forgive us as humankind where we're failing whether it be failing the environment failing each other failing uh, with in, uh, lacking integrity all those things lord forgive us and Lord, and help us and, and grow us to see more of your kingdom come and your will done on our planet and in our lives. And Lord, I do want to pray for those uh, this morning that um, need healing. Lord, we pray for your mercy upon them. We speak healing over whatever part of their body ails them. Lord, we thank you that you, you, one of your names is Healer. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit will minister to us. So we pray, Lord, that you would minister this morning to those that, as, as, that are watching this. Lord, that you, you would bring healing, that you would bring comfort, that you would bring deliverance. Your kingdom come, your will done. In Jesus' name, Amen. is enough more than I need and your word I will believe I wait for you draw near again let your spirit make me new and I will fall at your feet I will
presence in me, Jesus, light the way by the power of your word. I am restored, I am redeemed by your spirit. I am free, and I will fall at your feet. I will fall at your feet, and I will. Thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, and thank you again to all those who continue to provide material for these online services. If you haven't already do keep in touch with us, um, I'd love to put you on my email address list and you'll receive all that we send out as a church. Let me leave you with a final blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. You gave us grace, more than we deserve, a life of hope to live. You gave us breath to wonder at your works, to walk in faith, not sin. You're so good, you're so good to me. You're so good, you're so good to me. 
for the price is paid. I will give you all the praise. God, you're so good to me. You gave us love. So good.